Good morning and welcome to the 27th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee. Um, can I give apologies from Ian Gray, Jenny Goldruth and Tavish Scott. The first item of business is the second evidence session on the committee's inquiry in, into music tuition in schools. And this week the committee will be hearing about the experience and perspectives of practitioners. The committee held an informal session with a number of teachers this morning to hear their experiences and we would like to start by thanking those who took part in this morning's session. Um, can I welcome to committee this morning John Wallace, Chair of, Music, of the Music Education Partnership Group, Professor Geoffrey Sharkey, Principal of the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, Kenny Christie, Chair of Heads of Instrumental Teaching Scotland, Andrew Dickey, Committee Member of the Scottish Association for Musical Education, and Kirk Richardson, Convener of Instrumental Music Teachers Network from the EIS. In a large panel, um, and uh, it'll be a bit of a challenge to get through everything I'm sure that the committee want to cover, um, but whatever po possible witnesses to, to indicate to myself or the clerks, if they want to, you don't have to answer every question, but if you do feel you've got something to contribute, if you could let us know. Um, and uh, I'm going to start a session by giving the panel just a, a chance to have some opening remarks. So for, I'll go left to right and start with Mr Dickey. Thank you very much. For affording this time this morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Dickey. I'm here representing the Scottish Association for Music Education. For some time now, there has been uh, a degradation in provision of, of music uh, teaching in Scotland in terms of equity of opportunity for children to take part. Pricing has played a massive part in that. Children across Scotland have had, um, in some instances, music taken away from them. Uh, and in some authorities, it's free. The authority I work in just now it is totally free, and children can roll up and have their lessons just now, and they are happy beings. But to watch the tears of children who have the instruments taken from them and all of the other aspects of that, the, the kind of social exclusion from the not taking part in activities that their friends are taking part in is to be frank, it's unforgivable. So we are here today, uh, certainly I'm representing a, a group of over a thousand teachers in Scotland who are here to say that we need to, to do something about this. The, the current arrangement um, is, is not acceptable. Um, 32 local authorities are taking different stance points. Uh, and sadly, we're not represented today by COSLA who have declined to come to this meeting today. But we, we need to take a stance on this. We need to make it more equitable and fair for young people to engage in music making across Scotland. We have such a rich, cultural heritage in Scotland that we cannot let this go. Thank you. Um, Professor Sharkey? Thank you. I'm proud to be a new Scot of four years in length. And this is an amazing, creative, vibrant nation. We have something that is precious and unique. It has some challenges at the moment, but we can put our heads together and we can solve this. We need to get away from turf uh, and, and look to creative solutions from all quarters. There are ways that we should be able to provide access and progression. That has often been the missing piece for music. We need to get beyond the urgent concerns that every local authority has to the important concerns that we have in the local area and the national area for the health of our nation. We need to be having young people grow up with empathetic skills, team building skills, creative skills to respond to an uncertain future. Um, I think those things will actually give a return on the investment that will be amazing. And there are other countries that have shown this that we can compare ourselves to, such as Finland, um, which has been investing in the arts, has a partnership between the national level and the local level that feeds into its world-class elite conservatoire, not elite, um, elite in standard, but with access for everyone. Um, and they are an institution that is very keen to partner with us and benchmark with us. And I think we can learn a lot from uh, a nation like that. Um, I think there are new methodologies that we can explore. Uh, we want to maintain the standards of our teachers who are working so hard across uh, the sector right now, and we're producing new ones to to join, uh, and I want them to have something important to do for this nation. Thank you. Mr. Wallace? Scotland historically has got a fabulous musical education and educational system. Professor Sharkey's institution was set up in 1845 
by Charles Dickens in the thesis that arts and commerce were indivisible in the setting up of a vibrant culture and economy. So let me start with a sort of Dickensian analogy that music tuition in schools in Scotland is a tale of not two, but three cities. Edinburgh, UNESCO city of literature, strives to be a world-class capital city. And Glasgow, UNESCO city of music, strives to be a world-leading city encountering deprivation and social and economic problems in post-industrial society. And Dundee, the third city, city of the V&A, of biosciences and world-leading in the digital economy, all of these three have got free music tuition. So why, when Scotland's, some of Scotland's largest population centres for vastly different reasons have free music tuition as part of a rich educational and cultural offering does not the rest of the country. It just isn't fair. It's inequitable and it would take four million pounds of new money and collegiate working between local authorities and Scottish governments to sort it. It should be fixed. End of story. Mr Christie. Uh, well, good morning. I'd like to thank uh, the committee, first of all, for their inquiry and for the opportunity for uh, myself and my colleagues to be here uh, this morning and also to associate myself with Andrew and Jeff and John's uh, comments so far. Um, I think in this country we have a wonderful system. We have a system where all 32 local authorities have an instrumental music system, uh, service uh, in Scotland at the moment, and I'm representing uh, the heads of those services today. However, as we move forward, it is becoming a more and more inequitable system. Uh, we currently have fee charging policies um, which range from some areas, as John said, providing free tuition to all, some areas now charging up to £524, uh, and some areas, we, we currently have 16 con different concessionary rates uh, in the country, depending on where you live in, one being a concessionary rate of £117. Now, I don't understand why we can provide free tuition in some places, and yet a concessionary rate in some places is £117. It's not all about money. It's about ambition for our country. It's about aspiration for our children and young people. Uh, and to me, it's about excellence and equity, which uh, is obviously the, the driving mantra of the Scottish Government when it comes to education. Um, and at the moment, we are reaching a tipping point where we are not providing uh, these opportunities for all children and their families in the country at the moment. So um, it's great to be here this morning. I look forward to our discussions. Mr Richardson. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I represent, through the EIS, the Instrumental Music Teachers Network, uh, the members of the workforce who are um, delivering the product to the young people of Scotland. Um, and we're calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to change the law to ensure that musical instrument tuition is available as of right to all children attending state schools in Scotland who wish it free of charge. I also want to ensure that the school curriculum truly reflects the cultural ambition of the nation, the status of instrumental music within the curriculum requires to be elevated and the funding increased and protected to enable wide and equitable access to all children and young people who wish to participate. Um, as a member of the workforce, I'm very concerned that annually the instrumental music teacher is separated from instrumental, or should I say, music education in classrooms. Uh, this seems to be an accepted policy for local authorities, though you can have one without the other. But if we want a, pro a proper cultural educational music system in Scotland, then you need the instrumental music system and you need the classroom teachers as well. But uh, year on year we are cut because we are not in education beside the, the other teachers in the, in the classroom. And we seem to be a low hanging fruit that councils can cut every year. And until that's changed, this may continue to happen. And we'd like to see that changed. We have a fantastic workforce grown over the last 30, 40 years, all professionally um, working people yet they seem to be a low line through every year, and we seem to be considered along with uh, tank buses, 
uh, breakfast clubs. Uh, I just think we're comparing apples with oranges. We should not be in that bracket. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to open up to committee members. Dr. Allen, do you want to come in? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I was interested in what, what's been said there about the, the relationship between um, instrumental music tuition and, and music education, but in particular, one of the things that came out of the, the, um, the working group and the report that it made uh, some time ago about this subject uh, was, the, was the idea, or more than the idea, the, the undertaking um, that there would not be charges made for um, work leading up to an SQA exam. I'd be interested to hear from anyone um, who's working in the school sector about whether that's being observed or not. Well, the only yeah, member of the panel who's actually a school teacher here and uh, teaching in classrooms. Certainly within, uh, you'll, you'll have heard already from the rest <coughs> of the, um, the, the panel here, that it's, uh, it's not equitable across Scotland. So uh, in one the authority that I work in just now, there is no charging at all. Some authorities are charging for uh, students up into the end of third year. Now, um, this, I always find this quite amusing in, in that uh, music uh, tuition does not automatically start in fourth year for an SQA exam. There is a lead up to that. So it becomes free at fourth year. Uh, and many authorities, I don't have the figures to hand, but I'm sure uh, some of the, uh, Kirk will have that. Um, but the problem is that <laughs> they do not have free education up until that point, and it's only at fourth year when it kicks in. So, I have a comment on that. Uh, I was just speaking to our B. Ed. Uh, class for, of fourth years. We train uh, classroom music teachers. It has to be a partnership. Uh, I think it's wonderful that students participate in SQA exams up to higher and, and in some cases advanced higher, but you're only going to get the progression leading to excellence if that's matched by starting young, starting at primary school, uh, especially in certain instruments. Um, if you don't start strings, if you don't start piano, when you're in primary school, it can be too late. So in a sense, your question, we might, it, it may be being statute uh, statutorily honoured, but I'm worried about the ability for kids of all backgrounds to have access and progression in all of the instruments. So it needs to be a partnership. I can see John Wallace wants on that. <laughs> Instrumental teachers are absolutely essential if you want to go on to a career in music. Now the uh, curriculum for excellence is brilliant in that you know there's many more kids taking music now than they were before. But for the SQA um, uh, qualifications, um, you, you don't actually have to read music. And to, act, to, to make the, the leap, if someone decides, well, I want to go into the music business, uh, and I wrote in my uh, written evidence of how big that is, it's something like 4.4 billion in the UK, and, and it employs about 150,000 people. The, then you have to start sort of uh, specialising quite early, and there's a, this partnership between the instrumental teacher and most of the, these instrumental teachers, they've got degrees, they've got te teaching qualifications, they're teachers, they're teaching during the school day, this is curricular work, it's not extracurricular, it's not even co-curricular, it's curricular. I mean, why would we spend, you know, our lifetimes beating our head up against a brick wall doing the jobs that we've, we've done to have the credibility of music in schools being a proper subject and instrumental teachers and, and getting, you know, we, the RSAMD was the first uh, conservatoire in Europe in the world, practically, to have degree, its own degree awarding powers. And we went into this having degrees so that a, 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 a musician or a music educator is a teacher the same as everybody else. And uh, so it's this sort of real, the instrumental teacher is very, very important if the child wants to then take it seriously and go on to a career in music. But even then, if the kid doesn't want to go on to a career in music, it's a very enriching experience which improves uh, the, the, all of the child's other schoolwork. Can I just specifically address Dr Allen's point there about the, the 17 original recommendations? I think that's what you were referring to. And when it came to the um, SQA charges, um, so I agree that it obviously takes a lot longer in terms of preparation um, to be able to then 
access your, your SQA courses, and it may then be freely available come that point. Um, but there was a specific recommendation in 2013 that no local authority should be charging uh, when it came to the delivery of music around SQA level. And I think that's kind of the nub of, of the issue here. These were recommendations that were accepted by Parliament. And since 2013, some local authorities uh, conceded those charges, but some local authorities proposed to reintroduce those charges. So I think what we're talking about today is the shifting landscape again. Uh, and perhaps recommendations aren't strong enough. Perhaps we're looking towards a set of stronger guidelines uh, in the future, uh, if not uh, a, a commonly understood system or, or set of parameters that local authority music services are all operating within. Finally, thank you, uh, convener. Finally, uh, the, I'd, be, I'd be keen to get your view on how this compares with other subjects. Now, obviously, I'm aware that there are some char charges associated perhaps with home economics, perhaps with PE leading up to, uh, or, or indirectly leading up to the work that needed to be done for exams. But can you give a, a, an indication of how, how music you feel is, is disadvantaged compared to other subjects when it comes to that? I was just going to say that sometimes people um, bring up at this point home economics, uh -huh. um, physical education, etc., or indeed uh, with the, the higher drama or Nat 5 uh, drama course as well that you have to see and experience live theatre. The difference is you're not paying for the teaching element. Okay. Uh, and you can have consumable resources uh, in home economics that you go home and enjoy, uh, the fruits of your labours uh, at the end of a, a day, for example. And, and schools are looking at um, how they offset some of those costs. The difference is you're not paying for the teaching. Uh, and I think that, 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 that's where we are with instrumental tuition at the moment. And to pick up on Kenny's point about consumables, um, other subjects such as higher photography, sometimes students have to pay for photography to be published and to be presented, which is an essential part and key element of the exam. Otherwise, you cannot present your work as a folio. Uh, art and design. Uh, some authorities uh, are making students pay up front for materials uh, as well to actually and it enhances the, the, the product at the end. And therefore, sometimes some would argue we give a better overall project at the end. So they are advantaged by the, the fact that there's money there to help. Um, so there are a number of subjects which are helping with sundry items and, and these consumables, but none are for charging for teaching. Thank you. So it's worth pointing out that there's consumables involved in music as well. If you've got reeds to buy and oils and all these music other reads, things, music reeds, the whole, yeah, absolutely, the whole thing. There's there are numbers of things like that. I'm going to bring in Miss Lamont. Okay. Um, thank you very much. And uh, as someone who's a mother of uh, a child who actually went through the system benefited massively from it because we happen to be living in Glasgow. Um, I recognise the benefits of it and I, I particularly appreciated the skills of the instrumental teachers that were involved. I'm interested in whether, I think somebody said there was a tipping point um, in this and I'm just wondering whether we've created a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we're reducing the number of young people who are going to take up particular instruments. There then are not any tutors necessary and they go and then it's very difficult to sustain it. We got a table which showed that the number of um, tutors has been reduced by 350 since 2007. I wonder if any of you have any analysis of that. Is it particular instruments in particular areas that are, are suffering? You know, and, and to the point about the SQA, where, again, you create a situation where, because of tuition charging, basically young people are directed towards voice and keyboard and these other ones are lost and I just wonder whether that issue is, is significant but also that we're now creating a situation where it's going to be very difficult to sustain it longer term for the range of instruments that you might need. I think um, yeah, I think uh, we, we have reached that tipping, tipping point and the improvement service data uh, that was included within the, the submissions there have shown uh, for the first time in the year past 2017 going into 18 um, that we have now lost the number of children uh, participating across the country as well and that's been uh, quite well publicised this week. Um, that actually doesn't include 
current up-to-date data, that even that report's a couple of months out now. Um, but what we're hearing anecdotally around the country is the numbers are dropping now. So we have reached that tipping point. Um, as Ms Lamont uh, points out as well, the workforce has reduced uh, since 2007. We wouldn't say that this is because uh, there are specific instruments uh, that aren't being taken up. Um, this has um, achieved uh, efficiency savings in some local authorities. Some of this has been due to retirals and people not being replaced as well. Sometimes in, in some situations, people are teaching in larger groups now and not mm -hmm. uh, requiring those uh, additional staff members. But I think the, the concern uh, that organisations like HITS have is that beyond this tipping point, as, as, as you look to the, the longer term there, um, we're now getting into a situation that because of a range of various different and ever-changing landscape of, of uh, fee charging policies in the country, as we see less children participating in the system, we're reaching now a standstill of staffing, which you could actually say a hamstrung staff with no one to teach in front of them. So does that then lead to less children participating and over the course of time people then saying, well, now we don't need the staff because we don't have the kids. And as you say, over a, over a period of time, is this a self-fulfilling prophecy? I mean, our, our kind of narrative around this at the moment is we have a wonderful system. We want to develop what we've got. We want to celebrate that, not dismantle it. But at the tipping point we're at at the moment, um, we're seeing this gradual erosion from both sides in terms of participation, but also now in terms of workforce due to the, the decline in participation. So I was just thinking that some of the figures are masked. So it, it may be that somebody's retired, but if there's an incentive, creating an expectation you can do keyboard, then the, the more, you know, the French horn or whatever, which are less likely to be taken up mm -hmm. by a large number of kids. We're creating that because yeah. we're saying we're going to teach you in bigger groups and it's easier if you all do X and Y rather than these more, you know, I suppose the ones that fewer people would take up. I just, I, I suppose my sense is to what extent do you believe it's not just happenstance, there's actually going to be issues around the range of uh, instruments that young people Can are Can I come offered. in on that, Miss Lamont, if you don't mind? Mm -hmm. um, what we're seeing just now is, well, as, as part of these efficiency savings, is I'll give you, if you forgive me, an anecdote. Um, <laughs> um, we're seeing a, a violin teacher now being trained to teach cello, um, where a, a whole range of instruments are being expected, but there are real specialisms between both of those instruments that the, the, I've, I, I've, 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 I can't find anyone who can do both equally well. So the, the anecdote I would give you is that you go to your know, hospital for your cardiovascular surgery, but it's a neuroscientist who sees you as much as he is gifted and specialist. She or she is gifted and specialist in that particular field. It's not what you need. Mm -hmm. And this is what's happening across that people have been taught by non-specialists now. And, th and that might be part of this degradation I was talking about in terms of quality as well. And that's been lost in those figures too, not just the numbers, but actually specialism. Um, to quote um, uh, Brian Duggar from West Lothian many, many years ago, who's no longer with us, he talked about this pyramid of provision. He said that if, you, if you Scotland wants to reach for the highest levels, the, the base of this pyramid has to be wider. And what we've done, we've turned it in from, I don't know, equilateral, whatever it is, to isosceles, whatever it is, but we've made it really much, much, much narrower. And therefore, the provision that we can give is, is, is greatly reduced. Yeah, we, I, I can say some challenging stories and some good stories. So we are seeing some local authorities uh, having to make choices. So you can study these instruments, but not those. Mm -hmm. But what if the young person really wanted the instrument that wasn't on offer? What if they can't afford it? What if they can't travel to somewhere that offers it? We see it coming through in our Scottish admissions uh, into the Royal Conservatoire. We just had auditions last week. Some instruments have more young people coming through than others. But there are some good stories, some partnerships. We partner with East Ayrshire schools where they're teaching group lessons in strings and we work in a hub uh, in Dumfries House to help supplement that group teaching and then give some individual lessons and then have some of those come into the junior conservatoire. So there are examples of partnership and practice that are trying to stem that erosion and I'd like to see more of those throughout the country. Yes, the learning and teaching of, of music is very rich and you use different approaches as in most, most subjects, uh, Ms Lamont. And just to, uh, the, to answer your question about are the figures masking stuff, yes, they are masking stuff. There's a lot more 
proportion of group teaching going on in quite large groups out there. The, the teachers, uh, the productivity has gone up, I would say, about twofold because they're still reaching perhaps the same number of students, in fact more than they were in 2002 when we did the what's going on uh, uh, report, but they're spread much more thinly so that when you want the, the child who wants to progress into music has got much harder job then of getting the specialised attention that you that you need to really excel because grade eight or a ARCM or whatever you have is no longer high enough to get into a conservatoire. The conservatoire is at a, a world class level and it's set at an international level, which is a great bar for Scottish children to aspire to. But now it's very sad fact that you know the National Youth Orchestra of Scotland, you've got a much better chance of getting into that now if you're attending a fee-paying school in Scotland where you get the rich education that you were used to get in the state system in Scotland in music. So, uh, you know, the figures do mask the greater pr productivity. There's less critical mass in certain instruments like strings. We, <laughs> I always remember a, a, another anecdote, you know, where there was one uh, good young cornet player, suddenly two, three, four. It, it's children sort of rise on the tide with everybody else, and we've seen the tide receding in instrumental music in standards in Scotland over, and, uh, over, the, over the past few years. I was just going to say as well, we, we were talking uh, about um, further education, higher education and curriculum today as well, but um, Ms Lamont's point about the range of instruments also affects that kind of broader music making in the, in the community uh, and in, in your lifelong participation as well. It's great if you have to take the decision that everybody will just play the keyboard because that's all we've got available, but you start to then have, what, you have a nation of keyboard players um, and we don't have that feed into our local orchestras or our community bands and groups as well. So we want to retain that diversity uh, of music making and also opportunities for our young people, that choice, uh, that you don't want to just live in an area where you're only provided one instrument and that's what everyone uh, plays. What I would say about the, the group teaching as well, um, on behalf of my <coughs> colleagues, is we've got some great group teaching uh, in the country as well, um, when we are looking at quality and looking at pedagogy as well. But in terms of a pyramid, ideally you would like the structure where we do have fantastic opportunities within group teaching as an access, uh, but I think that's what we're all saying there. Once you, you're looking at that excellence factor, perhaps in some areas it's reducing uh, the capacity for that one-to-one -one specialist work. And time, Mr Richardson, sorry, you've been waiting very patiently. No, no, not at all. <coughs> there is a lack of equity, really, um, to the access given to pupils in charging authorities where the instrumental teacher's time is under financial constraint. So if, if I'm looking at pupils who are the, maybe, you would say, high flyers who may be going to the further education, etc., cetera, um, they, do, they do not get, in this instance, the one-to-one -one tuition that they often need because they're in a group situation. So uh, that really holds them back um, because group t teaching is the norm and it, it's time is money. And that, that's against everybody. So if there was an own charge and policy there, we would have flexibility and the instrumental teacher's timetable to cater for these people's needs. But they're being excluded a little at the moment. And on your point about instruments, most charging authorities do not charge year four, five, and six, it's free, but they charge years one, two, and three. If a pupil decides to uh, take music in S3, they are charged for that year. Mm -hmm. But some pupils do not have the, the, the means to do that, so they are then guided towards possibly four classroom instruments. So um, they are not being offered a wide breadth of choice of instruments, um, ones that would, you know, woodwind, brass, etc. The, 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 so the, the choice is restricted there, so there's no equity there either. So that, that does not help the situation. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Pai, you wanted to... Yes, yes, yeah. please. I'll ask you. Good morning, panel. Um, I just want to go back to the sort of general issue of charging and the effect it has on uptake. And um, from the, the helpful stats that we've received from local authorities across the board, um, we see that um, it's very varied and that most authorities are offering concessions for families with low incomes. 
can you say what you, how effective you think that, that has been or is, is, is being? I work in a school um, in the west coast of Scotland and the cut-off for a free school meal entitlement and, and that's the trigger point for free music education. Um, I know our colleagues in the other place <laughs> south of the border talking about just about managing. It's those people who are the people who are having to say no uh, to, to their, their, their children. We can't afford it because if they're just over that borderline and it's not a lot of money, um, they cannot. We've talked about if you're heating or you're eating. Um, Clarinet is way, way down that line uh, in, in many households across Scotland. So, yes, there is free education for those on free school meals, but um, when that entitlement, you just go above that, that parapet there. Percent concession, you feel is not. Uh, if, if, if at the end of my working week I've got six pounds left in the kitty, 50 percent, 80 percent, 90 percent, it doesn't really matter. I attended a lecture in my teacher training college, and, and uh, Professor Brian Boyd said the biggest issue for most of the teachers who go home tonight or the weekend is which bottle of wine would be most appropriate to take to this party? What would be, and it's not, it was the 10 pence for the swimming lessons that they couldn't afford. Yeah. And these are the biggest issues of uh, you know facing uh, parents across Scotland and uh, and as <laughs> with uh, the incomes that are coming they're, they're surviving on and just about managing. This is this this is kicked out completely. Sessions are a bit of a red herring. In that well, they are because anyone who's and there's a lot of people just in the cusp. And we talked um, a little bit about having to justify your poverty um, a lot of the time, and many people do not want to justify their poverty. It's an embarrassment to have to write to school to say, we, we just cannot afford this. And of course, there are local decisions um, in, in terms of families we, we would never know about, and maybe it's, we should know about, but we can't, it's not sustainable here. And, and I suppose many parents wouldn't want, you know, their, their, their oldest child to, to have the, have the, um, the opportunity uh, of, of tuition and then deny the rest of their children, so it, it kind of cancels itself out. Absolutely, and, and remember, even just, it's not just the, the, you talked about sundries and other items uh, that support things. These are the, the barriers sometimes mm -hmm. um, to, to, to people taking part in that they cannot afford, they know that there's going to be reads and books and, oh, by the way, there's going to be that excursion, there's going to be that bus fare, there's going to be, they know all of these extra additional things that come across. Mm -hmm. And they think, I'm not getting into this. Yeah. And that's a real shame. Can I just ask in general, is there, are there any other um, uh, factors that might you know, affect uptake other than charging, do you think? Um, is there anything that would, you, know, uh, you could attribute to the sort of downward trend? Uh, that, that we don't often recognise um, from these children. Um, I was re recently at the HITS conference and they had someone come in and speak about poverty and, and where it lay. And he said that children who are in that bracket become very good at actually, um, because they're ashamed of their situation, they will lie and deceive friends and peers not to be exposed. Um, I do have evidence uh, of other authorities who have offered some free lessons, they've offered free transport, and they've even offered, offered free accommodation and free trips on residential weekends, but the uptake is not there. They are refusing because of the, the actual stigma of being stigma. found out. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's, the stigma is a huge thing that we, yeah. we really underestimate in the country. Uh -huh. People do not come forward. And um, I think we just have to be very careful that when on application forms, etc., for people who want to participate, that that information is not seen by uh, staff and pupils. Mm -hmm. I think it should be really confidential. Yeah, be anonymised. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, just a couple of comments. We run a transitions program uh, for uh, the conservatoire based on uh, uh, your ability to pay, and it's oversubscribed, and its ability to continue going is up to the Scottish Funding Council every three years. We, we lobby to keep it going. Um, I, there, there will be inconsistencies in Scotland if we don't solve this. We have a wonderful cultural strategy for the health of the nation, but we want young people growing up to be able to play in those orchestras, uh, to be able to be uh, audience and appreciate that orchestra. You have to connect the education policy. We have a widening access, admirable policy that the, the world looks to, but where are those students going to come from if they don't have access to these free and affordable lessons and progression? I, I 
say on that. As well, in terms of uh, concessionary rates, to, to answer your question there, a lot of authorities do operate a, a policy at the moment whereby if you're, I'll use Dundee as an example, if you live in a household with a combined income of less than £15,800, you are eligible for free uh, instrumental tuition. However, it didn't mean to say that everybody with a family under that uh, was actually accessing instrumental tuition and it was freely available to everyone. So there are hidden barriers to participation as well. Uh, these can include geography, travel, uh, access as well, as you said there about siblings, uh, as well if there are more than one child in the house, is mum wanting three trumpets on the go at the same time? Um, or is it about you know, a lack of rehearsal space uh, or practice space at home? Um, there are lots of ways to overcome uh, these barriers as well. So I don't think it's all about cost. Um, I think it's something that we should promote more uh, about different and more flexible ways to participate. But that, that takes a lot of local conversations for that to happen. Schools should be doing that, you know, it wouldn't incur extra cost. Could, could, could they make it easier or more accessible then for children? And again, I don't think that's all about cost. Um, I think it's about knowing your local area, knowing your local schools, talking to, to parents and families, school and family development workers, head teachers, and um, saying that, you know, this is something that is available here. How can we make it work here? Is it better to, to operate in a group teaching context? Is it better to have something after school? Is it better to get the parents more involved in something as an opportunity? Opportunity. What I would say, though, is an authority with a charging policy that becomes more of a barrier to these flexible approaches, uh, because there obviously becomes more of a, a client-based service going on where someone is expecting 20 minutes of something for the money they pay. So the, the opportunity to have more of these creative approaches uh, to make them work for, for different communities and different school communities, uh, that opportunity is reduced because uh, you're then operating to a very business-like uh, income generating structure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, if I can try to answer Ms Mackay's question on this sort of philosophical uh, level, um, Scotland is a country with many socio-economic uh, problems. So it's not only about charging, but if you take a city like Glasgow, it's got 47% of its population in the you know, lowest quintile of the Scottish index of uh, multiple dri deprivation. 47%, that's, uh, that's like 287,000 uh, people. That's great. They don't have charging, so you don't have the argument there. But if you go around to, and we've been around other uh, authorities like uh, West Lothian or Clackmannanshire, which have, you know, you have vast differences in socioeconomics, even in those small authorities. You know, you've got Leafy Linlithgow, you've got the, the, the far, the Wild West of West Lothian, you've got Hillfoots and Clackmannanshire, you've, you've got, um, you know, you've got Aloha, and Alua Academy. So what we've seen on our travels around is that the what the the socio-economic uh, mindset seems to build a poverty of ambition as well. Now I know myself that music tuition can sort of really radically change that 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 mind that mindset. But what the charging seems to have done is, like in Clark Manninshire, you know, the Hillfoots have got more. So the more, the people who have have got more, and in Alloa, the people have got less. In West Lothian, it seems to be working, uh, uh, working the same. So of those 60-odd thousand kids uh, in, uh, in music tuition, the dem demography has changed. And that's what the research that we're doing now What's going on now, 15 years after the first, is actually showing. And this is sort of really depressing me as the figures are coming through. But we're seeing this postcode thing change in Scotland. And Scotland, philosophically, has always been about <laughs> equality. We were the f one of the first countries with universally free ed education. And a man's a man for, for all that. And it doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, we're not heading in that direction with this. And the results of this research will be uh, launched in Parliament in late January, early February of, of next year. I'm going to bring in Mr Richardson. If, um, when, when pupils see other pupils performing, that that's a great catalyst for them. So if I, for instance, ask an S2 ensemble 
to go and play to the S1s who've newly came to the school, they, they watch that and think, wow, I could do that. And then you say, who'd like to come for a trial? The teacher may ask, the class teacher, who'd like to go for a trial and get involved in this? You've got a big list of children who all want to come along, and they've got a trial in the three or four weeks, and you know there's a big uptake, and they love it. But if you go into the classroom and the teacher says to them, who would like to do this? But before you put your hand up, there's a charge for this. It's, the hands just go down. And whether, whether they know their parents can afford it or not, or whether they should go home and ask, that you, you'd probably get you know, two or three, not the group that you would have got with it if you don't mention the charge to start with. So, and I read from the Connect report <coughs> submission that you had that even in the concessions, parents who are reading these, it's a minefield because we have 32 variations of concessions, etc., and they find it a minefield as well. And there's reasons why they're not keen to fill in forms and the whole stigma thing as well. So, the, to me, the charging is the biggest barrier that I come across on a daily basis. I've just uh, had a primary project with 15 children, and they've come up to secondary school. And they all turned up on the first day, wanted to continue the process, and I then said, here, take this home to your parents, and of the 15, I got one return. So it's, it's staring me in the face on a daily basis. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to bring in Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I think we're all uh, very much persuaded by the, what I think is compelling evidence about the problem that we face. I don't think anybody's in any doubt about that evidence. Um, the, question, the key question for us is what we do. And I'm very interested in some of the international evidence, uh, Professor Sharkey, that you mentioned. Um, just before I come to that, Mr Wallace, could I just uh, confirm something? You mentioned in your opening remarks a figure of four million, if I heard you correctly. Yes. Could you just explain where that comes from? Well, the local authorities spend uh, about £28 million pounds, uh, a year on their instrumental services, and that £4 million pounds is in the fees that they collect uh, from parental contributions to deliver the, the, the services. So, uh, ergo, if you change the structure slightly and work with the local authorities, uh, if you had uh, four million pounds, you, then you would you could take away the fees. Do you, do you believe that 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 is the total figure that would solve the problem from a financial angle? Uh, <laughs> we, we, we've had it put to us as it's uh, rather more than that, and I just I'm interested in from the experts' point of view as to whether you think it is a four million that's realistic. Well, I think that I think that would um, maintain and sustain it at the present level but then I think you would get much more demand after that and it, it would mm -hmm. have to then be then be developed there would be consequences of doing that okay Professor Sharkey you uh, mentioned in your opening uh, statement about Finland and I've heard you on the record before talking about uh, some states in the United States of America that have looked at uh, different options could you just explain what lessons you think we can learn from international uh, situations that perhaps do this a little bit better than we are just now? Well, I think they, they have a partnership that, that works, and kind of their prescription is this. There is money provided centrally, but it has to be used for the art. So there's some statutory element about this. It can't be used for something else. They explore new methodologies, um, such as group teaching, advanced level group teaching. We're going to explore this at our own juniors. I know it's going on in good practice around the country. Maybe we can tighten it up. We can learn from Sistema's best practice around the world and lead that into individual one-to-one -one teaching. We need to have one-to-one uh, -one teaching alongside ensemble work because musicians don't exist in a vacuum. They have to be able to play with one another. Uh, we need to be able to celebrate all musics. So we have an amazing traditional music culture. We have an amazing classical culture. We have an amazing rock and roll culture. Uh, all of this needs to be celebrated and nurtured, rather, and a, an amazing jazz culture. Uh, we, we need to have all access to all of that. We need to recognize that it's not a zero-sum game. Mm. When I'm pushing these arguments forward, too many people say, well, what are you going to cut? Uh, what would the local authority cut? This is an investment in our future that other countries have shown give more than you put in, gives an amazing return in growing the economy, reducing mental health challenges in young people, growing that empathy. Uh, and uh, they, they've seen it work in places like Finland, in areas like Seattle in the United States. Uh, I, I'm convinced if we follow this prescription 
and work together, we can not only, as John said, sustain what we have now, but as John also said, we can go further uh, and, and make it world class once again. So do you think that the local authorities who are providing free tuition understand that perspective better than those uh, local authorities that are making charges? I mean, do we have more to do here in ensuring that local authorities un actually understand the full implications of what you're saying? I think understanding is part of it. Uh, I think the resource challenges will no doubt be different depending on, on where they are. Uh, and that's why I feel some kind of partnership um, between us as the National Conservatoire, between the national government and the local authorities uh, is something I'd love to see happen. And, and do, you, do you think that that would put very considerable demands on um, national government spending to have these partnerships? Because obviously it would cost some money. I, I guess I'd define the word considerable. I think it would be a thoughtful, thoughtful spend that we'll have, uh, as other countries have shown, an amazing return on that investment. I, I'm just t trying to tease out the, the reality of the situation, because there are local authorities, clearly, who have uh, very considerable financial pressures that they're facing yes. for understandable reasons. Um, and it, it's, it's difficult to tell them. In fact, it's not our responsibility to tell them, but it's, it's, it's a difficult thing when... Uh, we believe that there's local devolution when they are making um, choices about how they spend their budgets. Uh, and therefore, it seems to me from the evidence from which we have um, you know, gleaned our own facts that it does need an, a national intervention in a partnership deal with you know, the Royal That's what I would, I would agree with you, that. You would agree I, with I that. believe in devolution, but I also believe if money is provided in a mm. ring fence kind of way to keep music flourishing, then that's what it should be used for. And my final question just on, on that is, I mean, are, is there any um, sort of gold standard model abroad that you would like to see us spend a little bit more time investigating? Well, I think Finland is Finland. A, a, a country of similar size, similar cold winters, uh, <laughs> and a similar love of arts and culture that we could learn. And, okay. and, par and we'll be partnering with them conservatoire to conservatoire, so we'll get, get a lot of information from them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we can, um, did you want to come in, Mr. Christian? Yeah, I was just going to say that I think we have a gold standard model here. I, I genuinely do. I think we, we, we're not talking about building something that doesn't exist. We live in a country where all 32 local authorities have this. Uh, we have instrumental music services. We have these professional music educators. Going back to the figures, 28 million is what local authorities currently spend in employing these people who are already there in the system, the 4 million or 3.9 million uh, that uh, John refers to uh, is what the charging authorities currently bring in, in terms of fees. Now, again, that's not even uh, the same figure across the country. That's ranging in what Perth bring in to what Glasgow, well, Glasgow don't, um, but in, in, in different local authority areas. So that 4 million needs quite a bit of detailed looking at as to actually what that's made up of. Um, no local authority at the moment operates a full cost return uh, in terms of what it's bringing in against its instrumental music service as well. So when you do start to explore these figures, the workforce is currently uh, in place. Uh, the four million is just what the charging authorities are currently bringing in. Now, when we're looking at the decline uh, at the moment in terms of participation as well, um, that figure is going to start to reduce as to what's coming in. The outgoing 20 million will stay though. Yeah. And that, the, your argument is that there's nothing particularly wrong with the system, per se. Yes. But it's obviously not sufficiently well resourced and financed. I would it, say, I would say, not even in, in terms of in terms of finance and resourcing, I would say that the um, the the system is there. From a national perspective, though, the discrepancies are too great between how the system operates. I think there should be a degree of local autonomy in terms of how the system is delivered at a local level, when we were talking earlier on about knowing your schools, knowing your communities, um, and making the best, most um, effective uh, design of a, a music service to, to meet all the needs of children and families in, in that area. 
Um, so I do think the system is there and working. I don't think the policy aspect or the ever-changing policy aspect of the system is working at the moment against a background of a government seeking equity uh, for everyone as well in terms of the challenging policies and in terms, terms of the barriers uh, to participation. We can be talking within a two-mile radius uh, in some borders where some people are paying £354, some people don't pay anything. Uh, it's not a great system to have. Mr Dickey and then Mr Wallace. Yes, and I might come back on just something that Professor Sharkey touched on and talking about other systems. Um, the Sistema system, which you'll be familiar with, it's happening around Scotland. Um, a study in America was done of, of that, and for every dollar spent on the Sistema project, a dollar fifty-two was saved in terms of the social, the health, and all of these uh, these you know tangible benefits of a, of a really encompassing and, and comprehensive music education gave. Remember, that system was set up not as a music system. It was set up as a social, uh, a social uh, construct to take guns and ammunition away from their young people and to get them into a really positive destination. And I know the Scottish Government really supports positive destinations, and that's really what we're talking about here as well. So there was a... a the last thing I wanted to say on that was really about this, this nothing to do culture, uh, when, when young people have, are, who have, have got nothing to do in the evenings. This is what we're talking about. Kenny talked about um, our bands and orchestras. This is lifelong learning. And, and, and people are, are coming together in, 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 in towns across Scotland uh, this week performing music. But what we're, we're doing is denying them that opportunity because, as Kenny said, we, we haven't seen the first Scottish uh, keyboard ensemble. But we do need a, a, a range of instruments and opportunities, and that's what we're hoping to achieve today. Mr Wallace. Uh, in our visits to local authorities, <clears throat> we haven't found one yet that doesn't value the richness of the, the musical groups and the bands and the orchestras, the general buzz, the feel-good factor that it brings to the, uh, the school's environment in the, in, in the authority. And uh, so we've been working very closely with COSLA and Scottish Government, and you may feel that there's sometimes a no man's land that exists there between the two, but we found a real willingness to work together on the rather sort of precarious business of trying to get agreement between 32, as was got on the last time that the <coughs> Youth Music Initiative came out of the What's Going On report, and 32 local authorities signed up to that, although there was some lost out on it. So we would like COSLA at the moment to enable the creation of guidance on instrumental music tuition for local authorities and we're presently working towards that aim and what I say is the sort of way that we seem to be working is in a passacaglia you know that's the a ground base where it's a variations on a theme and the thing inches 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 forward so uh, we are we, we are working with them at the moment, and that's what we would like to see in the first instance. And if we get that, then we can have the sorts of uh, consensus that seems to exist in Finland, where, in actual fact, you know, not the whole thing is provided by the state. Pe there's parental contributions to the, to the thing in an overall way, not to the own kids or so on, but there's a general consensus that it is a good thing, so it's, it's contributed to. Now, they've got a super deluxe system, which we don't have at the, at the moment, but that would be an aim to go for the high ground, just as Australia is considering that at the moment. And if you think of the socio-economic effects of, you know, joining up with the economic and social philosophy of a country that's grown economically for the last 27 years in succession, then that's where we want to be as a nation. Okay, I'm going to bring in Mr Mundell. Thank you, Convener. That's uh, kind of preempted my line of questioning, but uh, after the discussion this morning and uh, your comments now, I just wondered what the uh, witnesses felt they would expect to see from a sort of national agreement or national guidance? What are the core things uh, that, that, that we should be looking for? And I know that sort of backwards and forwards discussions ongoing with, with COSLA, but given they're not here, 
what sort of things would you expect to see as the core um, of, the, of that agreement? Can I come on on this? I, I, I would like to see um, instrumental music uh, aligned along with the, the Scottish education music in the classroom. We're, we're imperative to, the, to, to the, the learning of the children, and I don't see why that we're separated every year and uh, just, as I say, easy to cut away. And the numbers are falling. We've lost 51% in 11 years, and it's it's a fast road, and it's declining all the time. And I, I just think uh, we should be realigned. Um, as I say, the service has grown, and it's a, I agree with Kenny here. It's a fantastic service. We have got a great product. It does need tweaked. It does need looked at. But I do think we have a great product. But for some reason, local authorities, because they can and because they need to, they, they have a budget, and we're in that we're in that element of budgets that can be cut every year for the instrumental teacher. And once we go, there'll be no coming back. So I think that's one thing I would like to see cemented is our, is our actual positioning and ele elevation within the curriculum. Further down into that, I, I instrumental teachers uh, have different contracts from other teachers and are they part of the collective bargaining and, th and things like that that goes on? We have, a, we have, a, we have a, a, a different contract from a classroom teacher. At the moment we are affiliated to the GTCS which has uh, happened recently and um, we are on the same terms and conditions as teachers and in, in the, me being in the fabric of a school I still have to report to parents I'm still under the, uh, under the head teacher's jurisdiction and, and my behaviour, everything I do, all that type of thing, you know. So I, I, I do re I do fill in reports, etc., and I, I do uh, work with my line manager. Uh, so I'm embedded in the fabric of the school, but it just seems that successive governments over the last 30 years have never actually thought, wait a minute, look at the fantastic job this service offers. Why is that out on a limb? It's just never, it's, everybody seems to have celebrated the fact of what it produces, going to concerts and all the shows, they say, oh, isn't this fantastic, you know, but never actually, nobody st stopped along the road and thought, maybe we should actually realign where these people sit so they're not um, considered against other factors out with education when it comes to budgetary cuts. Thank Thanks. Um, yeah, Professor Sharkey, first. Yeah. Uh, I came across an acronym in Scotland, GERFEC, getting it right for every child, uh, and I think that's, a, that's a, an amazing um, and noble goal, uh, and so what I would like to see is that we that we do come together. In answer to your question, Mr. Mundell, that we do come together. That there's guidance that local authorities uh, would would want to partake of. That there are resources, perhaps ring fenced around this, to nurture and protect this amazing service we have, but to grow it as well. I've got a potential army of young people graduating from the conservatoire, and we are committed to performing excellence and teaching excellence as being part of a circle. It's not teachers over here, performers over there. All of the folks who teach for us at the conservatoire are in the main performers and teachers at the same time. They are ready to help go into this amazing system that we have, uh, but we want to make sure it's nurtured, protected, and growing. So what we want to see really is that, firstly, we must sort of maintain and sustain and develop what we've got left of our formerly world-class system. Then secondly, uh, for beneficial, sustainable change, there's got to be first a change in policy towards music tuition. It has to be perceived as curricular. And then there has to be structural change in the way that's financed and delivered to make it sustainable in the longer term interests of Scottish children and in the Scottish economy and culture. And thirdly, we've just got to get on and do it. Thank you. Um. To, um, I think we need a, possibly a review of how this has been provided across Scotland in terms of each authority. There are really good things happening across all authorities. I've worked in another role before, which is an overarching uh, role across Scotland in terms of music. The, the provision is, 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 is patchy in some places, and, 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 and Kenny's talked about that in terms of geography and, and, and access to teachers and whatever. We need a bigger discussion about how we go forward from this point. We talked in, the, in this pre-meeting about an, a new narrative 
And I think Professor Sharkey's talked about that in terms of there's a willingness there, there's people out there who want to do this, they want to engage, they want to, to bring forward the cultural heritage of Scotland, which is not to be hysterical again, it's is, is actually been undermined um, by the very fact of charging exists for young people. So I think we need to have another, a, a really serious discussion. It may be at another time, it may be another place, but to follow from what John has said, it needs to happen now. Uh, we are, we are really a, a precipice now in terms of funding, because once it goes, it, it, it is impossible to come back. I, I talked in the meeting before just about the English system, which I worked in for seven years, and it disappeared overnight. And it was appalling. And, and basically, the musical culture in England uh, was, was destroyed. And if you look at, and we've talked about the National Youth Orchestra being one of the pinnacles of, of the Scottish, uh, of, of classical music as such, but there are n numbers of different organisations. If you look at the numbers of people who come from fee-paying schools, then it is almost exclusive, almost exclusive. And that is exactly the same for the National Youth Orchestra Great Britain. I work with the National Children's Orchestra uh, in London for a number of years, and it is exactly the same. It, they all came from the same uh, stable of independent private schools. It, it, where is this fair? Where in, the, in, in our statute that do we say that this is acceptable? So I think we need a really serious conversation, but I think we really need to have it you know, yesterday because it really is at that, st that stage. Um, Cultural loss mm -hmm. to Scotland there. Scotland accounts for 11% of the UK's live music revenue and music tourism brings in around 280 million a year to Scotland and secures more than 2,000 full-time jobs. And just a wee note here, in 2015 alone, 720,000 foreign and domestic visitors came to the country for festivals and major music concerts. So if, if this is allowed to die, there's a huge loss to this country commercially as well. We need to wake up to this. So Mandela, you mm. wanted to Hi, uh, Yeah, no, I'm, I'm grateful for, 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 for all uh, of that, that information, but just to, to push you a little bit sort of further, would you expect any sort of guidance to come out of COSLA to, to focus on developing standardised practices across all the local authorities? Do you think it should be setting out minimum expectations of, of what's expected from uh, instrumental music services, or do you think that that's a step too far? I think it will do that in giving case studies of best practice and perhaps a practice where it's had deleterious effects and hasn't uh, and hasn't and hasn't worked. I think you know, guidance is a great thing to have. But if we think back to the, where uh, Mr. Allen worked on 17 re recommendations, you know, uh, in 2013, uh, they they have a velocity and work for so long, but then they need reinforcing. And that's why I think we need words written in some sort of, you know, how difficult education bills are to get to get through. But I just think we need it reinforced in statute somewhere of these mi minimum standards. I don't think, you know, local th authorities on their own should be expected to come up with those. I think it's sort of. Uh, I think it's central government, and then there has be, to be a willingness to really to work together on that. And I think you'll get more willingness at the beginning of a parliament than you will towards its end. And so that's why I'm festina lenti on this. It's taken a long time to get where we are, and it's going to take a long time to get out of it. There's no quick fixes, but we can do very positive things just now, and guidance will be so much better, and, and it will last us for two or three years, just like the previous, uh, previous guidance. We thought it had, was job done, but it, it isn't. It unravels, especially in times of austerity, and a lot of this is due to uh, austerity.
Okay, and Mr. Chris, you want I was to going to say, um, in terms of, of guidance for national policy, could could be one way forward. Another way of looking at that and kind of reframing that could be the challenge to uh, instrumental music services in the country uh, in order to perhaps achieve GERFIC as well as, as Jeff was um, talking about uh, early on as well. Um, so if you look at different um, programmes that uh, receive uh, funding contributions centrally, things like the Youth Music Initiative, things even like um, Active School through Sports Scotland, they have to uh, abide by an agreement or a, a local uh, five-year plan, or in, in the YMI's case, a, a one-year plan, to an agreed series of outcomes over a period of time as well. I think that would be something that we could look at in the future as well. Uh, although there may still be 32 uh, local authorities operating at, uh, sorry, 32 uh, instrumental music services operate, operating at a local level, in terms of those agreed outcomes, were there any uh, additional funding contribution, the challenge to music services could be so what are we doing in terms of local delivery around looked after children? What are we doing in terms of meeting the needs of uh, additional support needs uh, through your instrumental music services? How are you ensuring that children within SIMD 1 and 2 actually can access these opportunities that you are making freely avail available? And what are you doing as an instrumental music service to share practice across the country and also to champion excellence? And what are you doing for your high flyers and, and in terms of uh, work, uh, developing the young workforce in the future as well and uh, next steps. So I, I would like to see something like that perhaps considered in the future, an agreement uh, towards a, a series of uh, ambitious goals. Okay. Dr Allen, is this on a supplementary or is it in a new area? Well, it was a supplementary and something that Professor uh, Sharkey <laughs> okay. said a wee while back, um, uh, if, it's, if I'm still yep. alive. Uh -huh. Uh, I was interested in uh, what uh, you had to say there about um, traditional music um, and uh, the, the, the wealth of that that exists in schools, but I'm also conscious of the fact that much of that um, happens in schools and happens in communities because of the dedication of a small number of people, certainly my own local authority area, many of whom will, of course, um, be uh, music and instrumental music tutors. I was interested really just to hear what you felt the pressures that you've been describing today, what effect they had uh, on the availability of, of, of people to learn about traditional music and particularly um, either on the, the choice of musical instruments that are available or indeed on the ability to introduce people to the corpus of, of Scotland's traditional music. I think it would probably face the same dangers as, as classical music. It depends if it's too far to go, uh, if, if you have the, the range of instruments on offer, maybe it's only bagpipe and not clarsac or not fiddling. Um, we want to make sure that uh, all of our authorities have access to both teach, celebrate, and nurture um, the, the amazing traditions of music that, that are exist in Scotland. So I don't have specific areas where I know that it's, there, there is less provision, um, but I would worry about it if, if, if we aren't sustaining our uh, local authority ed uh, music education. Um. Music Education Partnership Group uh, covers the whole non-formal, if you like, the Fashion and Gale uh, as well. And there's a tremendous richness in Scotland outside the schools as well. And it's all of those dedicated people who contribute to it. But if you diminish the core of what's going on in school, you then diminish the amount of aptitude there is to actually go out and teach. And also you'll find the individuals in school, inspired individuals who are doing all sorts of stuff uh, as well in any, in any community. You know, I'm driving 300 miles a week at the moment to, 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 to do a brass band in, in the other side of, of, the, of, the, of, of the country. And uh, so if you diminish the core, you diminish that. And the traditional music isn't just something that you do for fun anymore as well. It, it's, it's sort of, it's part of a rich heritage, you know, and it attracts so many people to this country. And also it's a route into employment now as well. When we started up the traditional music 
course, in 1995, the degree programme, that, that, that was a choice we had to make between rock and pop and jazz. We started, we did traditional music, and that has provided a professional pathway. And now Scottish traditional music is up there with the Irish. They go all over, you know, the 38 Highland Games or whatever that they are, that there are throughout the world. And I've gone and played in Moscow and Bonn and all of the rest of it doing this Maxwell Davies uh, p works. And, and lo and behold, they get a local piper from a local pipe band to, in Russia or, or, in, or in Bonn in Germany to come and play the Orkney wedding. Recently, I went to Malta. They've got 26 pipe bands in Malta, you know. And uh, this, as part of uh, our identity on the world stage as well, traditional music is enormous. So please, and it's, and it's a degree subject as well. We've got lots and lots of people treading the international boards who've got degrees in Scottish traditional uh, uh, mu mu music. And it's a credible modern subject, you know. I so, add, and increasingly I'll shut up now. <laughs> increasingly, we have people that are studying classical and trad, not only from Scotland, but from around the world. We need both those traditions to be strong. And Jeff, thank you very much for that, because if you want to cash, cash yourself back to, I think we could possibly say Martin Bennett, the late Martin Bennett, was really the founder of all of this, who was a graduate from the R RSAMD on classical violin, but also then bridged across the traditional, and he shaped what we have today, which is the most vibrant uh, uh, traditional music scene we've ever I've, I've ever seen or have experienced. So, this the, the very kernel of this, the very very beginning of this, was at the RSMD or the RCS at the time, and Martin, who sadly was taken from us at a very young age, started something that I could only imagine he'd be horrified to find out that that tuition today has been denied from these young people. I'm going to bring in Gordon McDonald. Watch you though. Um, a couple of times this morning, the, the word ring fencing has been used. Um, of course, ring fencing doesn't exist in local authorities, so if there was additional funds made available, whether it's the £4 million to um, offset the fees that are collected, or um, whether it's the £32 million for the cost of the service, how could you ensure that the money given to local authorities actually went into music tuition? I've purposely never used the words ring fence no, no, or no, statutory because I because I know that. So behind the scenes, we've been working on other uh, delivery methods for this, and uh, there are delivery methods uh, out of the in in music like the YMI Youth Music Initiative is delivered on a formula on a formula basis uh, to to music services and that has worked so superbly since its introduction in 2003 when one of the findings of that research was that 50,000 kids uh, a, were having weekly instrumental tuition, but 150,000 wanted to, wanted to do it. And last year, sort of 240,000 kids had YMI. So that's been a great success. So there's something in there that could get that's already existing. We don't want any more new initiatives because the education constituency mm. is just initiative doubt. Mm. So there are there are subtle things and it has to be subtle in Scotland I think because we are a developed nation with a very sophisticated model of government again this model of government is envied throughout throughout the world and we've got a sophisticated model of local government but there are ways and means of working together without ring fencing or statutory and so on they're already existing and we should be developing those I'm perhaps too new to the system to know whether the words ring fence or statutory can work, but I echo Mr. Richardson's comment that on the one hand, if you are strongly um, supporting uh, classroom teaching and SQA and hires, but you don't have a, an equivalent support for the instrumental teaching, there is a disconnect. There will eventually be, a, I fear, a, a less people wanting 
to take hires if they haven't been exposed to an instrument from a young age. So I don't know what the right words are, and maybe it's, as Mr. Wallace said, it's about negotiation uh, and a sophisticated sense of agreement, but we must do it. Okay. And, and you, you mentioned about YMI being very successful and over 240,000 kids uh, carrying out some activity on, on their YMI, YMI programme in 2016-17. Um, 23 of the 32 local, gov local authorities currently charge. If that charge was completely removed, what impact would that have on demand? How would they cope with that demand? And would there be a requirement for a selection process or an aptitude test in order to manage that demand? Great question. <laughs> okay. um, <laughs> thanks for that, John. Great um, first of all, I totally disagree with the premise of testing. Um, I've, I've, I've been in authorities, and people will smile up and down the country with the human saying this again, but um, uh, when you went into your English class, were you, uh, were you tested to see if you could take English as a subject? Absolutely not. Why do we test young people? And, and more importantly, why do we test young people on, a, on something they've never been prepared for? So I'm sure you studied for your exams at school. Many authorities, and I, I disagree with this completely, will, will actually take kids in and say, sing this tune back, tap this rhythm back, and if you don't do it to the, the, the level that we expect, and there'll be a lot of people maybe sitting around this table just now saying, my God, that was me, denied an opportunity to even participate at the very, the very beginning on a test that we, they were never prepared for. So testing is, is not the right way forward. The best test I always feel for people taking up, now, there are some exceptions to this in, in terms of aptitude, embouchure, um, physical ability to play uh, the size of the instrument, of course. Uh, but the best aptitude test uh, for um, a young person is their enthusiasm for the subject. How we manage that in terms of financially, I don't know. I would like my, my end goal would be that every single child in Scotland would have the opportunity and would be playing an instrument. We were sitting here with a nation of instrumentalists. There is huge amounts of evidence that it will increase our health and well-being. There is huge amounts of evidence that it will um, actually improve our attainment academically across the country so you sit here as an education committee wanting to raise the aspirations of, of young people across Scotland there's a really easy way to do it we're sitting here today telling you how to do it is to give access to all the Scottish children to music education how you fund that that is a difficult question um, but yes of course it's going to create more demand of course it will and so it should because then actually maybe we'll be spending less on our, our social care and our support for young people in mental health services. Perhaps we, we'd do that if we were bold enough today to, to go ahead with something like this. Okay, um, Mr Christie and then Mr Wallace. Sorry. Yes, I was just going to say, uh, just when you pick up on the, the youth music initiative there, we, we, we obviously need to bear in mind the distinction uh, between instrumental music services and the youth music initiative uh, as additionality. Uh, and also that the... the the Youth Music Initiative operates on a premise of every child having a free year of music tuition prior to leaving primary school. Um, the, the greater issue at the moment, I would say, is what happens after that free year depends on where you live. Um, so you could have a wonderful experience, families coming along to concerts and getting really excited about that instrument that you've got to learn, uh, and then you could be confronted uh, with a fee. The other thing about the YMI is, uh, the, again, the distinction between regular instrumental music construction uh, and experience one of the 240,000 uh, numbers in the statistic can be up to just 11 hours of a participation uh, so they are quite different things would the floodgates be opened uh, if fees were removed all over the place what a wonderful problem to have uh, I would start from um, I think we need to bear in mind that everyone won't want to play uh, but let's start from the place that everybody should be allowed the opportunity to start. And I think that that's uh, certainly what we would like to see championed in the future going forward. There are different models, there are different methods. Uh, but again, without that rigid fee structure, you would be allowed the opportunity to be far more creative, far more flexible in terms of how you allowed that opportunity to be taken forward. Take Mr Wallace and then Mr Richardson. Thanks. So there has to be a it's not just money alone. Uh, you, you're, you're right, it has to be managed change. And there is now the opportunity 
with new technologies and so on to actually get the benefits of music education to many more children. Now, I'm working at the moment with the Chinese uh, government and going over to the Beijing Central Conservatory every few months to work with them. Now, my first class of because I'm a brass specialist, my first cl class was 500 kids. And so I sent messages. Now, working with 500 kids is a new sort of methodology. <laughs> but I learned myself in a class of 40 in a junior brass band. That was my first experience. And out of that came my fellow uh, John Miller as well, who was second trumpet in the Philharmonia and head of brass. And then, Jim Gurley, who BBC Symphony Orchestra, uh, who's now conducting the River City Orchestra, Bob Ross, Munich Philharmonic. Oh, they, it's a very good way to start in this, in this big group. And if the Chinese government now are looking at culture as an economic uh, force in their education, and they're looking at Western culture, and they're getting people like us, because Jeff does this as well, and, at all levels of our education system to go over and show them how it's done. Now, we have to show ourselves how it's done at the same time, learn from what's going on in China, because that's a very vibrant uh, economy. It's got the same problems as we have between the haves and the have-nots, and it needs to bridge that gap as we need to do it. But what a fantastic problem it would have to, be, to solve it. And if we could solve it, in this country, then we can export it. We can probably even export it to, to Finland because when you get into these countries and you see what they're doing, they have similar uh, problems uh, to us. Mr. Richardson. Just to reiterate what uh, John and uh, Kenny were saying there, I recently uh, w went into school and witnessed um, they'd had a, an instrumental music teacher go in once a week and spend two or three hours on a whole class project where the whole class was given the opportunity to play together as a class, and the teacher also was involved, and she was learning an instrument along with the class. Now, the kids absolutely loved the fact that they could play better than the teacher, but she had to go away and practice at the weekends and things, you know, no bottle of wine that weekend, because um, to keep up with the kids. But the end result, and as you say, it might not be for everyone after that year, but the thing was, they did it as a class group, and they performed it as a class group. The parents got involved. It became a, a real community hub in the school, and there was a lot. There's a lot of success there. So they they were they were not tested. They were just kind of saying, right, and you come, let's pick an instrument, and we'll go for it. And they had a great time, and it's and it's a very valuable experience. I think uh, part of our um, committee visit on Friday night, we were also hearing about some PEF funding that's been used for whole class tuition in North Lanarkshire as well. So that was very right. interesting to hear. Very patiently, Rose Greer. <laughs> Thanks, Convener. Um, just picking up on a, a couple of the threads that emerged, particularly earlier on um, in the discussion, interested in the, it's not a discrepancy in the numbers, but the difference uh, that up until last year, the overall number of young people receiving instrumental music tuition hadn't fallen. Now, Ken had said, we've, we've reached that tipping point now. The numbers last year were, uh, not great, and anecdotally, it seems that the numbers for this year are going to be worse. But up until that point, you had year-on-year -year substantial losses of the tutors. And I'm interested in some of the evidence we've received indicates that what that was resulting in, um, because it was happening in the context of charges going up, is a shift in the profile of young people taking up music tuition. So the demand was still growing in communities and from families who could afford to pay. But for those who could not afford to pay, this was the, the obvious result. So I'd be interested in your thoughts and the experience you've had of has that, that shift in the profile of young people, the kind of 60,000-ish number that sustained itself through these years of tutors falling, was that 60,000 sustained overall nationally, but it was actually moving around quite a lot. It was growing in privileged communities and it was shrinking in less privileged. Data doesn't tell you, as you, you've just identified, is who is actually playing. Uh, and I think what we have seen in the past couple of years, as policies have regularly changed, that it's been quite, tra quite a transient population. It also doesn't tell us who's sustaining participation. It's just quite a cold number of who's playing at that time uh, during the year as well. So I think we need to do a little bit more work on that with local authorities in terms of uh, that kind of demographic as to, to who, who are playing within the system at the moment, how 
long have they been playing for? Are they sustaining participation? Or are we just in a kind of countless round of people are filling seats until the policy changes again, uh, and then we're seeing people give up? What we do know is that the, the figure from seven, uh, sorry, 16 going into 17, the numbers were dropping. We know, uh, sorry, the 17-18 report is dropping. We know actually anecdotally, um, even from the summer to now, that number has dropped yet again. Uh, so it's certainly our plan uh, to work with colleagues um, to try and do some form of further data extraction, um, probably this side of the spring, uh, to see where we're actually sitting, because it seems to have gone over the tipping point and we are on a radical uh, descent now. I'm looking forward to the uh, outcome of the What's Going On Now report that our team is working on. It was commissioned uh, by MEPEG. And I think it's going to make for some sobering reading of uh, a continuing uh, dangerous drop in the uptake, especially for more disadvantaged areas. In, anecdotally, in our transitions program, we have this amazing program supported by the Scottish Funding Council that gives you a free place at the Royal Conservatory of Scotland with mentoring. But we found it was hard to get musicians of the right standard. We were getting lots of actors, and so we tried to tweak it to start earlier, to go into primary schools, um, to get musicians starting earlier so they can reach that standard. So even in, in multiple art forms, we see that um, you know, access to an instrument, to the lesson, to repairing the instrument, to buying the music, all creates pressure on a family that might not have that income available. So I, I think we have seen a change. It's a wonderful program, the Transitions uh, program at the, R at the RCS. I have students who are currently on that program. However, I was asked once by a, a Scottish official, I won't say who, um, asking me if in my local area of Fergusley Park in Paisley, could they get me more ballet dancers for, the, for this program? And it's this kind of Billy Elliot moment. We don't teach them ballet in, in Fergusley Park currently, so why should we expect to have the people on the transitions? We'd love that, and that's what I think we're trying to reach out and to give provision for that. But if, if there's no provision there, you know, we're, 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 why don't they come? The intake in the first year of the Modern Ballet uh, degree programme at the uh, Royal Conservatoire, 50% of that intake came from the SIMD 2040s, which is quite staggering. Mm. And um, the, the problem with the postcode lottery is that we've got all these numbers to crunch, and it's a lot of postcodes, and this is going to make, uh, so it's, it's teasing out and analysing those figures. That's, that's been quite a hard thing to do. It's hard to have the hard numbers that will impress the people that wear the striped suits and who count up these, these numbers and, 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 and crunch them. The other thing that we're trying to do is to identify uh, rural pover poverty, you know, because we, we've got, that does exist pretty big time. People in the Highlands and Islands are on very, very low incomes. And uh, if you take the, the sea into <laughs> consideration, you know, it's, it's about the size of Western Europe. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really, really quite a large area. So we've done case studies in Shetland and we've done case study in uh, semi-rural and urban as well, Perth and Kinross. And we've done uh, part of it in North, North Glasgow. So we've got different uh, things to, to com com compare with, and we've got a lot of valuable data coming in from uh, the Western Isles uh, as well. Richardson. Just going back to your point there about the moving postcodes, it's very difficult for uh, a local authority to know why a person has left the service or doesn't want to continue. Uh, it's something that I've thought about long and hard, and it's very difficult because you're actually going to the parent and you're asking why has your child left the service? Now, the parent might not tell that child because they don't want to say, um, you're, we're not continuing with this lesson because we can't afford it. Because they do, they do want to send the, the pupil back into school to say, I've given up. My mum says we can't afford it. So I don't think when we're trying to gather evidence of why someone has left the service, uh, we, I'm not sure how, it's, how if we get the correct answer. Uh, um, you know, it's very difficult to gauge why they've left. It's, it's a hard one to put together. 
It's back to the stigma thing again. Yeah. Mr. Christie? I think it's important having that data and uh, we'll have the, the evidence from the What's Going On Now uh, report, which is quite a big piece of work as well. I suppose the question is, though, it's what we do with the data uh, going forward and what capacity do we have as music services, as, as partners and colleagues, uh, and in terms of local and national government, what capacity do we have to make change within that? Uh, we mentioned Gurfik earlier on, what capacity do we have uh, to really get it right for every child? But using that data, as, as Kirk's saying, a bit, at a local level, Level, I think we do need to be smarter with how, how we use uh, the information that we have and, and ask the right questions and identify in some places barriers to participation and explore uh, opportunities and strategies to remove these barriers as well. So it's not just good enough gathering the information. I think we need to, to be serious about what we do with it next. Do you have a publication date for that, that piece of work? For what's going on now, John Scott. It's going to be somewhere between <laughs> January the 15th and the 28th. Okay. We're going to take it to the cross-party group on music, Parliament first, and then we're going to bring it to you know, Parliament, or we're going to launch it here and then to HITS, all within the matter of about two or three, two, two or three days. And um, I think it's going to be important because it's not, not just going to be a wealth of, of data. Um, when we went to see the Deputy First Minister about this research that we're going to do, he asked us uh, then to provide recommendations. And we thought, my goodness, this is going to be really, really important, very, very difficult thing to hone recommendations <laughs> to make them feasible and doable. But at the moment, it looks uh, as, as though, where, where can I, where I can find, find the the um, the recommendations. Thanks very much, um, <laughs> Jeff. Uh, they'll be they will be in the areas of instrumental music services development. You know what should happen there. Pupil equity, as well. That's very important. Um, SQA provision, uh, possible enhancements to it, and also the early learners because that has been proven to have the most beneficial fat effect on everything else, the instrumental effect of instrumental music. So those are the likely areas. So, you know, it's not just going to be data, analysis, and hot air, and lots of lovely pictures. There's going to be hard recommendations as well. Brief question, Cleaner, yep, if that's okay. okay. Thanks. <laughs> Um, just, it's in terms of uh, staff uh, conditions, I suppose Kirk might have a, a particular answer on this. Um, Kenny made that point earlier that now that uh, pupil numbers are starting to fall, it may uh, actually perversely make it easier for local authorities to justify more cuts to staff because pupil numbers have fallen. But up until now, we've had a situation where the pupil numbers have not fallen, staff numbers have. And I'm wondering if uh, there has been any particular impact on the workload of remaining staff and, and their conditions where they're in a situation where there are simply less of them but just as many young people as there were obviously with the caveat of we don't know where the young people and the tutors actually are what the distribution is I, th I think I'm reading two questions in there um, if an authority does um, have to cut the staff numbers then it sometimes becomes um, almost a, a campaign of spinning plates so they're trying to keep the service maintain the service as is without taking anything out of the service to keep everyone happy, the politicians, the councillors, the parents. So they are spinning plates a little and I suppose then they have to spread the workload out more between the people that are left in the service. But then that tends to really affect the, the pupils because if you're in one school and then you're asked to then in the afternoon go to another school to cover pupils that were previously taught with someone else, you're then having less effect in the school that you were in, you're, you know, you, you, there's, they're not going to, the, the provision is lessened in the school you were in. So in that scenario, that can only go on for so long. It's almost like a downward spiral. Um, the, the staff will get, will get so thin. So what can happen there is the lessons can get shorter and groups can get bigger. So the quality of the lesson is, is diminished. But with the exuberant charges, and some of them are way above the, the cost of inflation, when they come in, then what, there's a, there's a, there is a tipping point there um, to how good the quality of the lesson is you're getting and with how many people is in the lesson. 
Back to the other question I think you're answering. If the pupils drop out in great numbers and you still have a staff sitting there with no pupils left to teach, then that authority would, has a decision to make within possibly the, the, a year uh, on, you know, can they redeploy the staff? Every local authority have their own policy, what they do, or will they make these staff redundant? And I feel once they, once they go, it's very difficult to, to bring them back. Very, very difficult. I suppose wh whichever way you look at it as well, whether it's um, you know, teachers' numbers re reducing, pupils' numbers reducing, ultimately it's a, a reduction in opportunity. That, that's what we're talking about. Uh, and I think it would be remiss of us probably today not to uh, speak about the, the impact on the health and well-being of colleagues uh, that are almost going through this continual funding cycle uh, at the moment on an annual basis in some areas, waiting to see if there are going to be cuts made within their local area, what impact that will have on staff, what impact that will have on the children that they teach. And, you know, as all good teachers are, they're very passionate about the children and the families that they serve. So I think we've got to be very, very conscious uh, of the health and well-being uh, of our colleagues and also in some places the the frustration that they feel that they, they don't have the opportunity sometimes to, to unlock their full capacity uh, because they're perhaps working to a financial target or a number of children that they, they have to, to teach in the week. And um, I know that the, the Scotland on Sunday campaign a number of years ago was uh, titled Let the Children Play. Uh, and I know that our organisation, HITS, would love, love to see the opportunity to let the teachers teach uh, in some places as well as we go forward. I'm going to move Gordon McDonald again. For a wee point of clarification, um, we've heard a lot this morning about uh, pupils taking part in music tuition has actually dropped. But is it the case that the number of pupils studying SQA examinations in music has actually increased? The numbers I'm looking at is in 2008, there was 4,451 taken a higher. That's now 5,730. And in 2008, there was 1,055 taken an advanced hire, and that in 2018 was 1,712. So is it the fact that SQA uh, pupils studying for an exam are actually increasing their music? Be conscious as well that as part of uh, your higher or your advanced higher now you don't have to play two instruments you could be combining music technology with that mm -hmm. uh, as well so that's maybe an explanation with the the rise in numbers of figures of of young people undertaking music technology uh, as part of these courses as well that can actually uh, increase uh, the presentation the number take music technology i think correct you sorry to correct but um it's the separate courses now um, so it's music technology, a separate course. It Some of the figures in the submission tool. Yeah, oh, sorry, sorry, in the submission, sorry, I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon, but they are separate subjects now, music technology and music performance is always two instruments. The only time that there's not two, uh, there is a performance at the unit for advanced hire, which is going, but you can do composition uh, as, as, a, as, a, as your main study, and that's only at advanced hire. Professor Shack. I'm delighted if there are more kids wanting to study higher in music and advanced higher in music. And in some ways, it does overlap with instrumental tuition, but we are talking about two different things. Advanced higher in music, it has nothing to do with getting into the Royal Conservatory of Scotland or indeed necessarily advanced higher at any university, uh, advanced work that requires um, a high level of proficiency in instrumental playing. So we've got to get that going from the youngest up through. But I think it so I, I, some, something to celebrate that many more children are, are, and that's one of the successes of the Curriculum for Excellence and the SQA uh, qualifications, that the instrumental teachers provide about 50% of that uh, qualification, and it's quite intensive work, and those are the kids generally who have looked at uh, music as a, as a possible uh, vo vocation, and so it's, it's the quality of uh, of, of what they get, so they need the real rich diversity of 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 choice. You know, I I, I was as like a first study composition of playing the piano, the cello, the viola, everything. You know, I only did trumpet second study when I went to the academy, but in the end, that's what I earned my living through was this thing that I just picked up and and learned in a brass band, and so. The, it's, it's very important to keep, keep it, the subject as rich as the other subjects in school are. Okay. 
Mr. Tricky. Also, come in on just one point, just to answer um, in, in terms of music teaching in schools, which this is this is what I do. Um, there is great, there are more. I think anecdotally, and I could I have to get the figures for that in terms of it's a very difficult figure to get. The people who have been presented for qualifications, uh, by and large, have been taught by their classroom teacher. Um, uh, and not by always by specialists. There are lots of there are, I can think of lots of kids in, in in our classrooms who have been taught by just I'm their only teacher, and I'm teaching them on instruments. But the, the convener has, has mentioned before keyboard and um, sometimes guitar, whatever it is. But they're not getting the specialist instrument uh, tuition, and, and I don't know the numbers on that specifically. And I don't think that that that's not available even from SQA. That's not that's not these are not numbers that we collect currently. But it may, it may be an increase in classroom, so-called classroom instruments, if we call them that, narrow bandwidth, uh, which would concern me that, that the wider family of instruments uh, is being neglected. And that was my concern earlier on. So, but I don't, I don't know the breakdown of these figures. I worked with SK for a number of years, but some data they may be able to collect in terms of their marking sheets, where they put down the instrument names, but they're normally done in paper, um, not electronically. So that might be difficult information to collect, but certainly we'll see on it. But you would never know that a person could have independent keyboard lessons out with that music school. So they may be having private tuition there as well. So it's, it's an unknown quantity, really. Okay. Um, looking around, I, th I think... Um, We've exhausted our questions for you this morning. Can I thank you all very much for your attendance? It's been um, extremely helpful to um, uh, how we progress with our inquiry and very much appreciate your time this morning. I'm just going to suspend briefly. We're, going, we're still in session, so we're going on to agenda item two. So if the members of the committee could um, remain, that would be great. But I'll suspend a few seconds to let the, the panellists... It's um, subordinate legislation on a negative instrument. Um, do members have any comments on the education student loans? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seemed to me that the um, recommendation of 30 years made sense, and you know, if, if that's taken forward to policy area, that is fine. I did have a question about the provision around the education psychology, because it says in the, the notes that this will run for an initial three years. But we're making a decision at the same time that, you know, somebody who is trained as an educational psychologist can't access post-graduate um, um, loans. But if you're only doing it for three years, is there a danger at the end, at the end of that process if somebody was training as an educational psychologist, they wouldn't then be guaranteed a student loan? And it's interesting the policy thinking around this because presumably nobody willfully takes on extra debt. Um, is described as uh, financial support, but actually it's um, access to a loan um, in, in a postgraduate course. And I just wondered what the thinking was. And not simply, it says they didn't want them to, they didn't want a duplication of funding. But one funding is grant, which I think we'd welcome. The other is a loan, which, which is not compulsory. So I'm just wondering if that should have remained as a, a safety net. I don't know what the, the policy of that is. And also I'm wondering, um, on the policy choices made by the Scottish Government, I, I don't know why they have not taken the opportunity here to increase the threshold to 25,000 until 2021. Um, I think everyone accepts that the current threshold is, is quite low. Um, and I wonder, it's a, I don't know what, the, you can let me know what the, the mechanism is for this. I know that we can object, I think, in the Chamber. I, I don't feel as if it's, I don't feel strongly about it. There's provisions in here that I think are quite important. I'm quite interested in why it hasn't included um, increasing the threshold to 25,000. I think the policy intent is to say not till 2021. I don't know what the logic of that is, and I would like to find that out. But this other this point I've already made about educational psychology, if what looks like a, a, an interesting package of support is for an initial three years, what are the guarantees subsequent to that? Because you would then presumably have to have another instrument at a later stage that reinstates the education psychologist being allowed to access um, student loan. I can't answer any of those points. Um, and we can tend to write to the government and, and delay a decision on this until next next week's meeting. I wouldn't want, sorry, mm -hmm. um, and I think you're, you're absolutely right to write to the government. My concern is that I wouldn't want to create a delay around what are very positive provisions around the 30 years. 
So whether we can seek some clarification, but I wouldn't be want to stand in the road of the, the provision um, being agreed. Um, but I, I, these are this, these two points that I've raised are maybe, you know, there's nothing that's going to happen in, in implementing it that would necessarily affect that, but we could still act right not on those issues. So, um, so you suggest we write to the, the government for clarification on those points, but we pass the instrument as it stands. Well, I think we agree not to, to say anything about it. Is okay. that the, the process? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is everybody content to do that? Any other points people want to raise with the Minister? No, nope, I think we've got a way forward then. Thank you. Um, so um, that concludes our public part of today's meeting and we move into private session and we'll have a brief five-minute break. <laughs>